Hey everybody, Who's Your Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking about episode 12 of season 1 of Arrow called Vertigo. And this is the episode we are introduced to the Arrow Universe's version of the uh, longtime DC villain Count Vertigo. There's also some really cool stuff going on with the uh, plots for everybody. So let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, uh, I gotta say, this is another really good episode of the series. There's a lot of balls kept in the air, but we kind of get to check in with pretty much all of our major characters. You know, even though you know, poor Tommy only gets a few seconds, but we do get to see everybody. And, uh, well, let's just kind of get right into what's going on. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, the very beginning, Oliver uh, pins the drug dealer to uh, the side of that build that... Uh, pylon or whatever you want to call that uh you know classic classic green arrow thing to do and something we've of course seen him do several times before now this poor guy is dangling what i'm guessing is probably something like 12 15 feet off the ground and uh he must be wearing a really really well-made jacket because it doesn't rip even though it's supporting the weight of a full-grown man uh i, I don't really think that's gonna work in real life Sort of like uh, if you ever watch uh, shows or uh, like kung fu movies or even Avatar The Last Airbender, somebody like May will throw a knife and pin somebody to the wall via their clothes. In the real world, the blade or the arrow or whatever would probably just pass through their clothes. But, you know, hey, we're dealing with basically a low-level superhero universe, so uh, Oliver gets to get away with stuff like that. Now, uh, speaking of superheroes, uh, let's talk about one thing that I did like was that Oliver, you know, you to, even though he's got this major mat on to hunt down the drug dealers and stuff for uh, making it possible for Thea to get into the car accident and to get into all this legal trouble, when Dig gets on his butt about uh, taking his family responsibility seriously, Oliver puts the mask and cape aside, stuff aside, and he goes and, bees with, and is with his family. Now, Come on, if this had been Batman, he'd have just sort of blown the whole thing off and was like, yeah, like, yeah, Alfred, go make some excuse for me, and then got, kept on going. But Oliver doesn't, and this is one of the key things that separates him from Batman. Now, obviously, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies are an enormous, enormous influence on Arrow. There, there, there really is no denying that. And they're pretty good movies. Not without their flaws, of course, but still pretty good movies. In the same way that Arrow is pretty darn good TV. But, you know, that's just kind of um, an important thing. Because really, when Green Arrow started out back in like the 40s and stuff, he really was just sort of Robin Hood, a Robin Hood take on Batman. But here we are establishing an important difference between these two characters. And I think that if you really do want this, if the show really does want to be able to shake the idea of it's just, uh, you know, TV's Christopher Nolan Batman show, well, then it does need to do stuff like this. Now, obviously, this, the uh, storytelling is probably going to continue to be uh, influenced by Nolan, along with the cinematics, but it's really in the characterization, in the choices that the characters make, that are really going to be what separates Oliver from Bruce Wayne. Okay, so let's see. Uh, now, of course, we do get to see some really great interactions between Oliver and Thea. Sometimes they're really happy and supportive of each other. Other times they're they're kind of at odds, which is, of course, a really nice way of defining a you know pretty accurate depiction of uh, siblings, yeah, at least as I understand it. I'm an only child, but uh, <clears throat> I do like that. I, again, one of the core themes that we're really going on here is family, and unlike Batman, Oliver does have a family. He, only his father is really gone. Now, granted, his stepfather's missing, but you know he has these people who are his blood relatives that he has to take care of, that he has to deal with, and who bring complications into his life, but who also bring love and support and provide some basically keep Oliver tethered to humanity. Now, it's not just his family. Of course, he's got Laurel and Tommy and Dig and other people, but still, it is really this relationship between Oliver and what's going on with the Queen family that is the core of so much of what is going on. And if these guys did not seem like a real family, a genuine family, then this show would have probably been dead right out of the gate. But the writers and the actors have really made the Queens seem like a real family. They're a flawed family, but they are a believable family. 
you know, I'm reminded of that uh, quote. I believe it was from the famous Russian novelist uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky. He said, um, boy, I hope this is Dostoevsky. Uh, Every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. Well, the queens aren't always unhappy, but they're not exactly jumping up for joy at 24-7 either. And, uh, boy, is the way their family is unhappy pretty darn unique, huh? But anyway, we do get to see uh, those little... Uh, was really great little moments, especially like in the early part of the episode where Oliver makes it a point to call Thea Speedy, her old nickname, and even explicitly says to her when she's like saying, I wish Dad was here, she says, I'm here. And and the sort of surrogate father, of course, goes hand in hand with Oliver's role as her older brother, but with all, with uh, their father gone, with Walter missing, it's undeniable that Oliver's now the man of the house. And He's actually doing a pretty decent job. Not a perfect job, but, well, in a family, nothing's perfect, even when you're doing a good job. But uh, let's uh, continue on. Now, one thing that I did get an enormous kick out of was that we learned that Mia's middle name is Dearden. Sorry, did I say Thea or Mia? I can't remember. Well, anyway, of course, the uh, female Speedy in the comics was named Mia Dearden. So now her name is Thea Dearden Queen. So it, it, this pretty much rests uh, any questions we might have as to who Thea is meant to be based on. Okay, she is a riff, if you will, on the character of Thea, who of course comes from the comics. And I'm just pointlessly repeating myself. So, okay, that's cool. This, uh, you know, uh, you know, as a fan of the comics, I gotta say that's pretty darn cool. Uh, let me see here. Uh, now, uh, talk. let's uh, bring things around. Actually, no, let's continue talking about Thea since uh, she's one of the main things that's going on here. Now, the uh, the other big thing that is uh, interesting about Thea is when she goes kind of off on and has her little spiteful hissy fit. Uh, you know, wanting to throw throw that really nice deal that they got her out of the way. And she even blatantly says that she's just doing this to spite her mother. And while this seems extraordinarily foolish... We, as we are reminded, Thea just turned 18 two days before this all happens. You know, Thea is in many ways still a kid, no matter what the law says. And this really is the kind of thing that kids, especially teenagers, will do. Now, it's not just limited to teenagers. I've seen full-grown adults do exactly this kind of thing. I have seen people who, just out of pure spite, have gone and burned, basically burned their lives down just to just to teach their family a lesson or some ridiculous thing like that. And it's a horrible, horrible tragedy and an awful, awful thing to watch. And, you know, imagine, and that's just me as an outsider looking in on other people. Imagine how it must be for Oliver, her brother, her, who loves Thea more than just about anybody in the world, to realize the possibility that his sister might be going to prison. And Oliver's a guy who has a little bit of an idea of just how bad prison can be. Now, granted, uh, Thea's probably not going to be going someplace quite that bad as, uh, you know, Purgatory Island, or whatever the heck it's called in Chinese. But, uh, yeah, uh, prison, not a picnic for anybody. But uh, I do like that it is ultimately when the truth comes out that the queens are really able to come together to forgive each other their trespasses and genuinely let that family bond blossom. Now uh, I'm gonna I have some a little bit more to say about this and what's going on with Moira and such uh, later on, but um, I want to talk about some other things first. Uh, but to continue wrapping things up with Thea. Um, Honestly, I accidentally stumbled across a little bit of a spoiler reading what I thought was going to be a review for uh, the last episode. So I knew what was going to be happening with Thea's deal with the cops, with the authorities, before it showed up. And uh, I am a little sorry that that ha did happen because I thought the idea of like, okay, Mia is going to be working for Laurel, coming as a surprise, probably would have resonated with me much stronger if I hadn't... Uh, already know what was going to be going on. But again, this is actually a very cool idea. I really like it. Now, uh, people, we've talked a few times about whether or not uh, Laurel is going to achieve her ultimate destiny of becoming Black Canary. Well, 
was probably quite a ways down the road, but I have no reason to think it's not. But the idea of her sort of acting as a mentor towards a younger here, a younger person. Okay, this is totally in keeping with the sort of thing that Black Canary does. She's good at that. I mean, uh, that's basically the kind of the role that she's been cast in on the Young Justice cartoon. We've seen her do that in the comics. You know, Black Canary is very much a team player. Uh, now, granted, her uh, relationships with uh, the younger teen heroes and such has not always gone particularly well. Uh, if you're familiar with her relationship with the Ray from the comics, where, okay, uh, just because it's awesome in a horrible, horrible way, I'll tell you. Uh, basically, the Ray, teenage hero, basically around 17 years old, major crush on Black Canary. Uh, some Green Arrow does something stupid, breaks Black Canary's heart. She's in an emotional low point. Low point takes the Ray's virginity in a kind of a moment of weakness. And of course, the next morning, it's this horribly ugly situation that, uh, you know, now a lot of people really hate that uh, storyline because, uh, well, it's certainly not Black Canary's finest hour. And uh, given how generally awesome Black Canary is, I can't really say that I blame them for not caring for that story. But the way that scene is written... I honestly have to give it some pretty interesting props. But uh, I'm going off on a rant. I'm sorry, a ramble. So let's bring it back here. Now, people have kind of speculated as to whether or not Thea is going to be falling into the role of Speedy, Green Arrow's sidekick, at some point in the future. Um, I'm not really going to comment on that, because uh, not because I've read spoilers, but because I've read... Uh, some casting stuff, let's put it that way. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on that, but the idea of basically Laurel acting some, towards someone who symbolically is a younger hero. You know, again, she is a riff on the character from the, the comics who is Green Arrow's sidekick. That just seems like some really some beautiful symmetry to me. That is using the character of Laurel exactly in a way that fits with her character, that is totally in keeping with the sort of person that she is by the time she's become Black Canary. And again, this kind of opens the door for some very interesting possibilities for Mia at some point. Thea! Thea, jeez. It opens up some very interesting possibilities for Thea in the future. And it also gives her a much-needed mentor and a chance to, you know, really grow up. You know, just start getting some ideas about what she wants to do with her life. But, uh, okay, so uh, let's bring uh, things around to somebody else. Um, not a whole lot to say about what's going on with Dig this episode. He's, he's doing his usual thing. But I have to say, the guy was complete and utter gold when he really pulled that, pulled that tennis ball trick on Oliver. That was, that, was us, that was a reminder of us, for us, as to why Dig is important why Oliver chose him as his partner. Because Dig ain't Alfred. Dig will get in Oliver's face and do what is necessary to get him to back down. Now granted, he's probably not going to be all, always be successful in that. But, you know, that is, that is the main difference between Dig and Alfred. Alfred would almost always go along with whatever Batman wanted to do, no matter how strenuously he was opposed to it, because he saw that as his role in things. You know, again, Dig is Green Arrow's partner. He is not his servant, he's not his sidekick or anything like that, which makes the, the dynamic between them very different and also extremely interesting. Although I will give Oliver some credit, uh, saying, I don't need the bow. You know, okay, that's pretty badass. And uh, even though he's messed up on drugs, Oliver is able to go out there and succeed in his mission. Again, that's uh, some pretty badass stuff. And uh, since we're talking about uh, that sort of thing right there, let's talk about uh, Count Vertigo. Uh, played by a fellow by the name of Seth Gable, uh, best known apparently for the TV show Fringe. Uh, I've seen one episode of Fringe, so I, get, I really got nothing to say there. Uh, he certainly does bring a lot of energy to this performance, and you can tell he's having quite a bit of fun with the role. Uh, the only problem is he seems he thinks he was brought seems to think he was brought in to play Heath Ledger's version of the Joker. Oh, come on, I've only had half a bottle of this. Jeez. Darn, darn you, 
darn you Danish beer. Anyway. And, you know, really, that's my main thing with uh, this take on Count Vertigo. Now, Count Vertigo is somebody I've read um, a few appearances of him by the in the comics. I uh, certainly did enjoy his uh, appearance on the Young Justice cartoon. Very, very nice take on the character there. But uh, his thing in the comics is that he's a Count from some fictional European country, and his uh, family name is actually Vertigo. And... You know, he's a character who's been around for basically since the old times, like the Silver Age or something like that. So the ridiculousness of all of that is just inherent. It is the history. So it makes no sense. I mean, sorry, it's, it makes absolutely, it is absolutely no surprise that they would choose to do something very, very different. Because, well, if you were to try and put that on TV, people would laugh. So, again, this is a, a fairly reasonable take on what somebody very realistically based on Count Vertigo could be like. The only problem is that, um, and it's really, I can't say, any fault of Gables. He's really bringing it here. He's really having fun with the role. He's doing, putting his whole, a lot of energy into it. It's just the writing of this character is very weak. We get to see that Count Vertigo is sadistic and kind of weird. And obviously a pretty intelligent guy, you know, all um, straight out of the Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan, Joker, you know, the whole Heath Ledger thing, you know, straight out of that playbook. And the thing is, beyond that, there's really nothing to him. He's just this sort of weird, energetic, excitable villain with a sadistic streak. So... Now, I do like that at the end he survives, and we're kind of left with him in a situation that hints that maybe we could see him again someday. The idea that he has survived this major vertigo overdose, well, in the comics he would come back with superpowers. Now, I seriously doubt we're going to see somebody with superpowers anytime soon on Arrow, but... You know, this does open the door for them to do do something different with Count Vertigo next time. And I hope they take that opportunity because, um, you know, for uh, all of Gable's uh, energy and such with his performance, uh, this character just doesn't have a lot of punch to him. Now, um, oh yeah, sorry, there was one thing I forgot to mention when it comes to Mia. And they're talking about her uh, when she was busted as, a, as um, a few years before all this happened for shoplifting. And, um, I'm sorry, sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't Thea, this is when we were talking, when Laura was talking about Sarah, man, jeez, maybe this stuff packs more of a kick than I thought, whew, all right, let's, uh, let's back things up and start, uh, talking about, um, since we previously mentioned Laurel, let's start talking about what's going on with her and her dad. And uh, Laurel brings up that Sarah at some point during her teen years was busted for shoplifting and Quentin stepped in and made sure she didn't go to jail. Okay, let's take a stop here. You Juveniles do not go to jail for shoplifting. Okay, if a juvenile gets arrested and has to be incarcerated, they're going to get sent to Juvie Hall. Alright? And Last I checked, they don't send you to jail, Juvie Hall for shoplifting. They just don't. There's not the beds for it. If you're going to get locked up in Juvie Hall, you've probably done something fairly serious. Now, if you're a repeat offender and you get caught shoplifting, well, maybe that will get you thrown into Juvie Hall. But if you were never really convicted of stuff, if your cop dad made the whole thing go away, then Again, you weren't convicted of stuff, so that can't happen. So, Laurel is, pr at best, doing some hyperbole there. Now, I do like that she kind of really gets on her dad's case and says, you know, Sarah is not the saint that you think she was, and that Sarah was responsible for herself. She was responsible for her being on that boat which is a complete 180 from the line that she, what she was giving Oliver in the very first episode. And this is a sterling example of how far uh, Laurel has come as a character and how much her relationship with Oliver has changed. I mean, 
And she, one of the first things that she said after seeing this guy again, after she thought he'd been dead for five years, was, I wish you died instead. Excuse me. And the idea that she, when she's ta talking to her father, saying, you know, Sarah was no saint. Well, this is really one of the subtle themes of this episode. Quentin just can't accept that his daughter wasn't completely the person that she thought that he was. Thea cannot accept that her mother is not the person that she thought her was. And Oliver, I'm sorry, Thea cannot accept that her father was not the person that she thought he was. And Oliver can't accept that his mother is not the person he thinks she is. You know, Quentin really gets this thrown in his face, and Oliver and Thea are hit with some pretty harsh information about uh, each of uh, the parent that they were Id idolizing at the time. And, yeah, I mean, ouch. Now, granted, it's a little bit more serious in the case of what's going on with Oliver, but uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we're also brought back into uh, via Count Vertigo the subplot of what's going on with Oliver and the Bratva. And I do like that they brought the same uh, guy back. And we get a little bit more insight into what's going on there. Now, if you follow me on Twitter a few days ago, I floated the idea that basically people join gangs in prison. And the island Oliver was on, I'm just going to continue to refer to it as Purgatory because I can't be bothered to remember what the Chinese name for it is. Uh, we know that there were other pe that it, there was a prison there. There were some extremely dangerous people there. And if you even pay attention to this episode, you can see there's a guy in the cell next to Oliver. Now the Bratford dude even mentions uh, some guy by name and says that he speaks highly of Oliver. Uh, the fellow's name slipped slipped by me. I think it was started with an A. So the question that kind of went through my mind when I was posting on Twitter is: Could Oliver have joined the Bratva? while he was on that island. Now, Oliver, in regards to the fellow, the Russian fellow that the one guy mentioned, says, like, yeah, I saved his life. Now, okay, now right there, if you uh, save a life of a Russian gangster, well, that might just be the doorway, the doorway in, for some people into organized crime, especially, well, into the Bratva, especially for an American. But what's also interesting is that the Bratva guy in Starling City apparently contacted this guy, which means at some point this dude had to have also escaped the island and is still alive. And let's not remember, let's not forget, in it, Oliver, as we see in this episode, can speak fluent Russian. So I'm thinking whoever this Bratva guy is, he's a pretty important person. And uh, if uh, Yao Fei does not make it uh, alive through the end of this season, well, there's somebody else out there who might uh, potentially be able to serve as a mentor figure to Oliver. And uh, let's see, you know, Chinese general and your, is your first mentor, and then some kind of Russian gangster your second? I mean, it, it's kind of crazy, but it certainly would go a long way of explaining how Oliver picked up all these uh, various skills that he's learned. Uh, now let's see. Uh, speaking of Yao Fei, uh, like I said last time, I really didn't believe for a minute that he'd totally turned on Oliver. Obviously, there's still stuff going on there, but also, obviously, Yao Fei is still on Oliver's side. So the question still remains, why did Yao Fei save Oliver? Why did Yao Fei apparently join up with Eddie Fryers? You know, what's going on there? And, um... Well, Oliver, it looks like he's not uh, hes not going to let this situation go. So that's definitely uh, something to look forward to seeing the answers to. Uh, let me see here. Ah, uh, yes, and we, of course, get another appearance by the delightful Felicity Smoke. Now, I like that they acknowledge that the, the excuses that Oliver is, are, is throwing her get stupider and stupider each time. Now, Felicity might have been able to just uh, blow one weird instance off, but, you know, she's really becoming his go-to girl for information. So, at some point, Oliver is going to have to level with her or, you know, feed her some reasonably plausible BS. Frankly, I think I'm sponsoring the vigilante would be the most reasonable one. But, uh, the problem that we have this episode is that Oliver takes the vertigo to her and asks Felicity 
and I quote, to run a full spectral analysis on this stuff. Felicity is an IT worker at a large multinational corporation. She is not a CSI. They do not train people who go to computer science classes how to run full spectral analysis on drugs. They just don't. I mean, the idea that he even asked this of her is just so ridiculous. It, it, I mean, it's laughable. But apparently, smart people with glasses can do anything on this show. I mean, look, folks, I like my, I love CSI, and as enjoyable as I don't rag on the show for its lapses in realism, of which there are many. But this show is not CSI. And bringing in something this ridiculous, it is... <sighs> I got no... It's just stupid, okay? I have no other words for this. And especially when you think that a rich dude like Oliver could have just had this stuff sent to a private lab and, you know, played enough of a shell game to keep it from being traced back to him. But... Again, it, this is just stupid. But it does uh, open the door for Felicity to show Oliver the list that she got from Walter, which in my book is basically one step for her closer to becoming one member, a member, a full fledged member of Green Arrow's inner circle. Now, is Oliver going to be as 100% upfront with her about what his deal is as he is with Dig? I'm thinking probably not. But, either way, it looks like we may have a new addition to Team Arrow at some point. And, uh, that's cool. Oh yeah, I did briefly want to speak about McKenna. Now, uh, that's uh, the female police officer that Oliver used to know back in the day. So, with uh, Huntress gone kind of have to wonder how much longer they're going to let it go with um, Oliver not having a romantic interest of some sort. Uh, McKenna, I could, again, a little too early to tell, but I could see her as possibly being uh, um, on the list. You know, Oliver dating a cop, give him a plenty of excuses to go over to the police station and piss off Quentin, who apparently is willing to continue to take out his uh, hostilities against Oliver on Oliver's sister because, you know, Quentin Lance is a dick like that. And uh, a lot of people online have really been uh, pulling for uh, Oliver to have something going on with Felicity. Now, uh, I, if you've uh, paid attention to my other videos, you know that I don't pr I do not do the shipping game that's, um, that's playing with fire as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I like to keep things cool and relaxed around here. Uh, I will say, though, that I think there are some genuine interest, genuinely interesting possibilities either way. And, you know, maybe this is just completely wrong. Maybe this is uh, a character who is uh, waiting to take the stage. Will be that. But, again, I think that it is only a matter of time before we get somebody else in the role of romantic interest for Oliver. And I have a feeling this is probably going to happen before the end of the season. Now, again, I avoid spoilers. I'm just sort of uh, giving you my feelings on the situation. And uh, let me see, is there anything else? Uh, we do get to see a little brief scene with, between Tommy and Laurel showing that there's, um, even though there are a couple, there's still um, a tiny bit of friction here and there over some various things. And the, when Tommy answered the doors, answers the door and Oliver's there, you, you can kind of tell he's a little uncomfortable with the situation. But, uh, you know, you're talking with your girlfriend uh, about, like, snuggling, and then suddenly her ex-boyfriend shows up at the door. You know, your best friend or not, that's that's got to be that's got to leave you feeling awkward inside. But anyway, um, just, just double-checking my notes here. Nope, that covers everything that I can think of. Again, another pretty solid episode of the show. I had a really nice time watching it, and I am, once again... Really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next time. So anyway, folks, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. And until next time, take care and have a good one.